Greetings, everyone. Nate the Nerdark here from Nerdarchy for Nerds by Nerds. And with me, I have Nerdarchist Dave. Hey, guys. Hey. What's going on? Do you want to oh. say it or do you, do you want me to say it, Dave? Well, guys, we're supposed to have Keith Baker on today, but we cannot find Keith Baker. So you have me and Nate today, <laughs> possibly asking the questions we were. Maybe we can ramble off the list of questions we were going to ask Keith Baker. I don't know. <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe he'll show up. Um, I'm connected with him over on Facebook, and he hasn't seen the link yet. So hopefully everything is well and good with Keith Baker, and there's just a scheduling conflict or a mistake. But that being said, here we are. This is our 13th, maybe that's the problem, our 13th live stream. Uh, perhaps 13 was just an unlucky number. And I'm going to be popping out the chat. As am I. So that I can see what you guys are talking about while we do this. So uh, what, uh, one of the difficulties I'm realizing with bringing people on for the, the, the live chats um, is uh, someone had made comments about us not reading, you know, all the uh, all the comments in, in the chat and, and the questions off. I, I feel like one of the real difficulties is when we actually have guests on, is like we, you know we want we want to talk to the guests and have them talk and stuff like that. So maybe we're we're not delving into the chat as much as we would like to. Yeah, like when I answered that mystic question yesterday when DFC was here, I probably should have just waited. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, nah, it, it's fine. Like, I, I like doing a mix of both. And and for us, it's going to be a matter of figuring it out. And also, like, I, I suppose, too, like, the bigger the guest is, the you know, the, the more it's going to be about, you know, them and what they're doing. Um, like, I already confirmed, you know, uh, yesterday, Matt Colville is supposed to be here tomorrow. So, or not tomorrow, uh, Friday. And then um, I, I'll shoot him a confirmation uh tomorrow just to be sure and you know live and you learn all right so i spent i spent i've been spending all this time guys trying to uh schedule guests and get cool people on but maybe uh part of the one of the things i need to do as well is make sure i confirm the day before uh and make sure we're getting them on because i feel really bad that uh keith isn't here and i told you guys he was going to be here and i was really excited to talk to him because of all the of all the campaign settings that have been published by Wizards of the Coast and TNSR, Ebron is the one that I've run the most. So, uh, and I've heard really good things about it. I haven't, I haven't run or played in Ebron ever, but it sounds really awesome. <laughs> well, I it did. It was when you know Ebron came around, and I took a break from D and D for a while, and just games in general that weren't video games, and. Um, I, when I came back, it wasn't like there was Ebron game for me. So, if there was one available, I would play in it, but if I had time, obviously. But hmm. uh, Scott wants to know if we think Ebron will ever do another, or if Wizards Ghost will ever new, do another world competition. That's hard to say. I don't think so. We we actually entered a couple worlds. We entered we entered the first incarnation of Ulthgany, and I entered my Shattered Realm world which actually had a lot of like Ebron like elements in it where it wasn't it was definitely far off from your standard fantasy uh so it's, it's hard to pick out the uh, questions from, from the chat from you guys too because you guys do a lot of talking to each other which is cool and Kyle big mouth <laughs> <laughs> big mouth in turn Changelings are awesome. Shifters are awesome. And Warforge is awesome. And I think Nate would have really dug the Kalistar. Yes. Um, I was going to remake the Kalistar for 5th edition when it, when I was doing my Sonic stuff, but I see Art Wood has one. Dun, dun, dun. He, uh, put, in, <laughs> he put in the chat. <laughs> Kyle asks, fight me, Dave. I don't know, man. You're kind of skinny and little. <laughs> whoa, 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 this guy knows Tai Chi. You better watch it. I would. I wouldn't actually say I know. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't actually say I know Tai Chi. <laughs> I am taking Tai Chi lessons. I, I, I heard this guy's taking Tai Chi cheek lessons. You better watch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, but well, that being said, I do DM for a Kung Fu master, and I am friends with uh, 
another D, uh, Kung Fu master, if that counts. Um, oh, man. So is there, student. Do you it, start off every campaign like that? Now the master is now the student. No, not really. He'd be like, I will hit you and you'll die three days later. <laughs> no! <laughs> so where's everybody co uh, coming to us from? Let's bust out the roll call early today. And then uh, we also have a question from Boulder Rocks. Uh, how would you go about having a paladin order that's lost its way and it's and is now corrupted? That actually would be uh, uh, pretty fun to throw into a game. <laughs> that would be. I'm sorry, I'm laughing about the chat. Um, Scott, Scott, staff writer Scott's weighing in from Wilmington, but I know that's not where he's from. I don't know why that makes him laugh. They, so I, you know, I've seen that tro trope in, done really fun in the um, Demon War saga from R.A. Salvatore, you know, with the with the Order of Monks, where they basically had an offshoot uh, after after it was kind of corrupted by the Demon Dactyl. So you could do anything like that. You know, we even we've done videos too about you know uh, cults infiltrating a church and possibly you know, creating an, an offshoot. You know, the, the fact that they're paladins isn't really all that relevant. That you know, that's just you know, that's how the organization organization is started. So, you know, from there you would just creep and their oaths would, hmm. would would change. And I would say if you're gonna have an order of paladins, those paladins are also gonna have knights who are not anything except just a generic knight in the NPC monster manual section. Or is it the player's handbook monster manual section? Whatever, whatever the knight is back there. I would say a lot of them are knights, and you're gonna also have some commoners and squires and things like that. Because if you like if you make a Templar order, they've got a lot of people helping them out to make them be able to just do their holy knight swing and sword stuff. So make sure you include that kind of stuff. I mean, that's where the corruption could have maybe started, in fact. Is um like a cult infiltrating the assistance to the the uh, paladins. So, uh, I lost the chat. I was going to, here we go. Sorry, guys, I'm moving things around over here. So, we got Cleveland, Ohio with uh, staff writer Doug, Mr. Productions, Ger, I guess that's short for Germany, where he's from, uh, Scott, like I said, Wilmington, Orange, Ca Orange County, County, California. We got Art Wood out of Phoenix, uh, Sean Johnson, Washington State. Upstate New York, Harrisville, nice Illinois, Jersey as always, uh, Maine, New York City, Texas, Tennessee, another Jersey, Syracuse, New York. We got some more into Ohio in the house, Michigan, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Florida, DC. Uh, someone wants to know. I'll, go, I'll, I'll delve back in the Shattered Realm. It kind of, it kind of dovetails nicely to um, the Eberron discussion we were supposed to have. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. You did not miss the roll call. We're just doing it right now, my man. Nebraska, Florida, Ohio. Uh, we got Vermont, Texas, Washington State, Winston Salem. Nice guys, nice. So Shattered Rum was I, I ran some games in it, and the the basically the the premise of the game of uh, the campaign setting, the world was the world had already been destroyed. Ragnar Ragnarok had happened, uh, the apocalypse had happened, Armageddon happened. Hey Mexico, what's going on, brother? Uh whatever you want to call it. It happened, right? And it literally blew the world apart. And what was left were these floating rings of land masses and floating islands. And everything in between them was called the Ether. And, you know, in in the center of this region were the Psy Lords, right? And they were... Um, obviously, basically like... Uh, like the, Almost like the Sorcerer Kings from Dark Sun, but... Uh, far less evil. All the nobility in the civilization were were psionically gifted, and the whole civilization espoused the power of the mind. Well, the they had several rivals. One being the sorcerer kings, which were, you know, actually sorcerers. Uh, that that part of humanity was just, and uh, and those races were just awash with sorcerous origins, and 
they were a conf they were in conflict with uh, the Psy Lords. Then you also had the lands of the Ogre Thanes, which were basically, you know, um, more intelligent ogres, uh, basically o ogre magi that I think I loosely based them kind of like a, an Aztec civilization culture. And, and they were also, you know, at odds with both of them. And then the, then like um, wizards, you know, wizard magic was actually kind of outlawed. And it, it was, you know, basically they were, they were seen as being those who would uh, broker and brook deals with demons and devils. So they were considered uh, fiendish or uh, unclean, essentially. Uh, then one of the things we like, I one of the things I had too was airships. So, was that there was a certain tree that they would cut down that would actually float in the ether, so they could you know they could make ships out of this and it it, it would float. So that so that was in a nutshell. There was some definitely there, there was some steampunk elements in there. It wasn't really arcana punk the right way Ebron was. And that that's it in a nutshell, which means I've lost the chat. So let me see what's going on over here, guys. Well, Scott Scott Garibay would like us to um, see into the future of what what D and D would ha like. Okay, so the D and D movie, if it were a huge hit, like seven hundred fifty million or more, would that hurt or help the tabletop role playing game? And why or why not? I. <sighs> God damn it, Scott! You in that movie? You won't let it go. You're like a dog with a bone. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, the movie can't. I I don't believe the movie can hurt the the industry. It can help only help it. Yeah, because if it, even if it flops, it's not going. It's just going to prevent more people from coming in. I don't even think so. If it flops, there will be a certain number of people, even if it's two, that because of it, the, their awareness has been raised, and they might look into it. If it's good, you know, it could have, you know, it could have a definitely have a positive impact. Hey, Professor Bill, Ragnarok, roll call. I'm from Asgard. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> You're not different worthy. Comic, different comic book split personality every day. <laughs> uh, let's see. I think uh, Rhett just said what we said, pretty much. <laughs> no double-headed uh, Ogre Magi. That's only World of Warcraft. And I don't know, mm -hmm. did did they continue with the double-headed uh, Ogre Magi on War uh, Warcraft? Because, you know, I didn't play... I only played the strategy game. I never played um, the, the uh, MMO. Maybe as a monster, I did not remember you being allowed to play it. Yeah, yeah, in this, the strategy game, you weren't. Okay, Keith is coming. Yes, we're not liars. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, he just chimed in. And listen, Nerd Arcus Dave has learned a valuable lesson. From now on, he will confirm uh, prior these things just to be on the safe side. Uh, did he give us a time? time uh, ASAP. Please. Okay, cool. So any minute now, we will have Keith Baker in the house. Oh, they had symbiotes in Emperor. That's cool. Oh yeah, yeah, they like magic items, and the demon dackles were so cool. Like they did this whole thing with their version of the Far Realm. They had so many cool threats in Eberron that you like. There was the Dreaming Dark. There was the Lord of Blades. Um, there was the uh, is it was it the Emerald Enclave? Like the. Dude, there there was at least like ten different like major threats to the world just kind of like flowing in the background, and that doesn't even include the five nations that are that were having a cold war with each other. Good times. <laughs> like, sounds they, like it would just be easy once you read the the book on it. It sounds like it would just be easy to just come up with tons of different campaign material for yourself. Comic Book University Vin Diesel should direct, cast, and star in D and D. I don't know about the I, well. I don't know. Like, has he directed anything? Like, is he a good? Like, would he be a good director? I like him as an actor. But uh, you know, th those other things are specific jobs, and the question is, would he be good at them? No. Although the he'd Emerald, probably be Emerald better Claw. at uh, Order of the Emerald Claw. 
that was the one I was thinking of. And then there, then there was also like the, the like this council of dragons that had their own secret agenda. And then there was the prophecy of the dragon. I always, and I always loved the uh, the aberrant marks, which and then there was also like a storyline with them, like a terrorist organization. Spellhawk Press. Eberron is what got me started in D with D and D. Love swaths, uh, buckling espionage feel. Yeah, there was just so much good stuff with that. And hey, like, folks, I'm apparently completely in the dark. Uh, you are. Hang on a second. I'll get some lights in here. Just a second. <laughs> we have summoned and oh, conjured right the ghost of Baker. <laughs> Shadow key. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, Eric in South Dakota. <laughs> Jeremy Iron should play the villain, and I don't know if they should really the chamber. Yeah, that's exactly the dragons I was thinking of. Um, I don't know if they really should associate anything from the early movies with the the next one. It's just such a bad taste. Maybe the one thing they maybe can do is the is the uh, the quicksand carpet. All right. We have lights. Hello. Hey Keith, how are you doing? I am doing okay. Sorry about that. It's uh, I'm on Pacific time, which means it's still pretty early. And, yeah, yeah. And, uh, I just didn't notice uh, notice the time until just now. So I'm glad I didn't miss things completely. So you, hi, folks. Do you by chance have headphones? Uh, I do. Hang on. <laughs> I'll put them around my hat. Cramping your style. I know. <laughs> All right. I'll just take the hat off. People can see my head. It's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> well, right. first of all, thanks for thanks for coming out. I appreciate it. And uh, glad to be here again. Uh, sorry, so late. I'm not a liar now, so that's good. And uh, so Keith Baker, Ebron. You've done a bunch of board games. Gloom. Phoenix Dawn Command, a uh, very successful Kickstarter. Those are the things I know of, but mostly I know you for for Evron because you beat you beat us when we entered the competition. But um, <laughs> that, was my, that was my sole goal, really. I was like, I'm getting those guys. They're going down. Yeah. So so uh, that was really cool, and you know, I, I guess like right now, I guess like um. You've done a lot of stuff, but what you're known for probably is Evron, right? Like that's what everyone wants to talk to talk about. Uh, the funny thing is, actually, you would think that, but it's actually Evron or Gloom, because I also made a card game called Gloom that uses transparent plastic cards. And what I find, and that sold half a million copies. Mm -hmm. And what I find is, people either know me for Gloom or they know me for Evron, and very few people realize I did both. Nice. So, so basically, it depends on whether you're a, you're a board gamer or a tabletop role player. Precisely. But you also did what is it? Horror from Atlantic City. The doom that came to Atlantic the City. Doom, that's it. Uh, uh, which was almost our doom, since since that was a terrible. That was one of the worst kickstarters in history, and basically a guy who. Uh, Said he was starting a game company. Um, my friend Lee, who was the artist for for Doom, sort of put his trust in him. We had the game that was basically completely done and ready to go to print. Uh, he raised one hundred and forty thousand dollars and essentially just took the money and spent it on a whole bunch of stuff. No hookers and blow. So pretty but much, game, but the game did come out. Yeah, well, basically he didn't do it, uh, but then. Uh, after he canceled it, Cryptozoic originally, uh, and then they split off to Renegade. But yeah, Cryptozoic did it and gave everybody who backed it a free copy. Uh, and then recently, uh, Renegade split off from Cryptozoic. They took Doom, and in fact, at the moment, in a couple of months, I've got a game based on the comic Scott Pilgrim uh, that's going to be coming out with Renegade. Great, I like that series. That's cool. Yeah. So, so the reason so. why I brought that brought up that particular game because we're out in New Jersey and literally live like I live like thirty minutes from Atlantic City. So I, 
I, I just thought it was cool. And I had found that game uh, mm -hmm. before, and I didn't realize you had worked on it. I never, you know, I never looked at yeah. the designer, and it was only when I was doing a little research um, this morning that I was like, "Oh, you actually did that game." No, no, I've done, I've done quite a few. So, uh, Doom came to Atlantic City. I have a copy within my eye line right over there. Uh, Gloom. I just did a Kickstarter for a card game called Illimat uh, that'll be coming out this summer as well. Um, so, yeah, and, and of course, in the role playing world, uh, Phoenix Dawn Command uh, came out last year. And so that's a thing I'm going to be doing more support for uh, in the next couple of months. And if I remember correctly, Phoenix Dawn Command, that uses cards? Yeah, so Phoenix, it uses cards instead of dice. It is a traditional role-playing game. You know, you do have a character, you do have a game master. Uh, but essentially, the thing I hate most in a die-based system is when you have the dramatic moment at the end, you're facing the villain, you make your big, you kill my father speech, you use your big wrist attack, and you roll the one. And you're just like, that is not how that scene was supposed to play out in the movie in my mind. And in Phoenix, everybody has a deck that is essentially your character capabilities. Um, you have your class abilities sort of laid out in front of you. So those are persistent. Uh, but basically it means while things are random turn to turn, depending on what kind of hand you've drawn, you can look at your hand and know what can I accomplish right now. And so it means in that situation, I either know I can pull off uh, the attack, even if I'm going to have to put a lot of resources behind it, or I know I can't, and then I'm not going to make the big speech. I'm going to figure out something else I can do until I get some more uh, cards in my hand. So uh, it's more the about, other, yeah, go on. It's more about resource management. You know, uh, essentially, it is yeah. just within the turn. It is a matter of you know what you're capable of. So it gives the player a little more narrative control because it means, again, I know uh, if I can succeed or fail, therefore I'm going to role play the scene accordingly. Uh, the biggest other twist about Phoenix is Phoenix is a game in which death is actually the character advancement mechanism. Uh, basically, your character can die and return up to seven times. Um, you have a pool of energy, a pool of energy called sparks, and those you can burn both to do supernatural abilities or to push beyond the capability of your current cards. But when you run out of sparks, you die. So it is resource management, but it is also a matter of sacrifice. It is a question of saying you can basically buy success but is this the right time? Is this the moment that that sacrifice is worth it? When you die, you don't come back right away. You don't come back where you died. So it's very much Gandalf in Lord of the Rings of saying we go into the dungeon, we run into a bunch of orcs, and we can handle that because we're badasses. We run into a troll. It's a pretty damn tough fight, but we'll make it through. When we hit the Balrog, it might have been our, our mission was to find out what the hell is going on here. Now we have but we cannot beat it. It will simply kill us all. Uh, and now the question is, how do any of us get out of here? So someone's saying, I'll hold the bridge. I'm going to take it down. Uh, they'll die. Again, Gandalf doesn't come back for a couple chapters, but he does come back, and when he does, he's stronger. That's very much the point of Phoenix, is that we may have a mission where we say, we're dropping you in this village. There's a zombie outbreak. You have two hours to contain it before it spreads too far to be contained. And as long as you can do it, it does not matter if, uh, if you die in the process. But if you all fail, if you have a TPK, by the time you come back, it's too late. It's spread out of control. Now the story's not over. Now we're going to have to deal with the consequences of that failure. Uh, but the point is, again, it is a game where sacrifice is actually rewarded in part of the story. You know, who will be the person who holds the bridge? And that's a kind of moment where in a typical D&D game, I'm not going to make a dungeon where I'm just like, oh yeah, and the boss at the end will kill you all. You have no chance to fight him. You know, whereas in Phoenix, it's defeating him is not what the game is about. The game is about, again, you know, accomplishing the mission, which may or may not always, you know, mean total victory, as it were. So... 
now I'm just kind of thinking because I'm thinking about the the medium we're using right now to communicate and and how some of our games happen. And a lot of games are happening. So with the the card system, how, is it hard to pull off online? Uh, so it's something we've been talking to a couple of of tabletop you know simulators uh, about how they would like to handle it. Uh, beyond that, each player does have their own deck, so you could do it. Uh, online, it is simply the case that basically as it stands right now, there is a base box set that has enough cards for the entire group of players. Uh, either everyone has to have their own copy or you just have to mail people their decks uh, because it is a matter of you're looking at your cards and you're deciding what to play and you're drawing new cards and things like that. Um, so it's not ideal for online play, but again, there's a couple of different ways you can handle that. Box set. Those are words I have not heard in a very long time. <laughs> uh, it's not only a box set. It weighs five and a half pounds. So nice. it is a box set you could kill someone with. Well, uh, what does that retail for? Uh, that retails for $65. Uh, it not is, bad. Yeah, it is 300 cards, a 500-page book. It's everything you need uh, for Game Master and four players, and it includes a seven-mission adventure path. So basically just, boom, right from the box, you've got everything you need to go for a while. Uh, and it is a role-playing game, so it's designed for you to make your own missions and stuff. It's just there's seven ready to, to use right away. Yeah, I mean, I've paid, I've paid that much just for a book, and it's no Invisible Sun. <laughs> yeah, and basically the point is if you, if you think of it, Phoenix is essentially what you're getting is all the rule books you need, uh, the equivalent of all the dice and minis you would use, and a seven mission, you know, adventure arc. So it's 65. On the surface, it's like, ooh, that's a lot of money, but it is literally everything your entire group needs to play for a couple of months. So I'm going to, have to see if um, our resident gu guru has checked it out yet or not. He's pretty pro prolific when it comes to uh, various RPGs. This one, though, occasionally one or two will slip through his fingers. I'm I'm pretty happy with Phoenix. As I said, it is a very uh, it lets you tell stories that don't work in a lot of other systems or settings. And people have asked me, like, could we play Phoenix in Eberron? And you certainly could, like mechanically. The main point is that Eberron as a setting, uh, by default, isn't designed. Phoenix is a setting where uh, the world, and it is a fantasy world, you know, is under siege by a host of supernatural threats. We don't understand why it's happening. We don't know how they relate to each other. It's sort of if you mash up World War Z and Pacific Rim. You know, all we know is things are getting worse and they're happening more frequently. Um, and basically, as Phoenix is, you're the only people capable of taking on any of these threats. And so the point when you translate it to Eberron is you need to have a sense of there is an existential threat that it basically it is worth it for us to lay down our lives to accomplish our goals. If you just say you go into a dungeon and you're trying to get a magic sword, it's not like that's something worth you know, giving up one of my lives for. Um, so with Eberron, you'd want to say something like, there's a new Dalkir incursion. Or, you know, you'd have to set up something where there is clearly uh, a, a very dramatic threat. And Eberron certainly has, again, all the pieces for those sort of set around. It's just by default, the world is in a more passive, uh, peaceful state. They're not. They're not directly in play. No, I totally get what you mean. We were actually having an Eberron discussion without you. Uh, before yeah, yeah, you fair got enough. Up. And uh, and that's one of the things we were talking about. Is like I'm like, there's like ten different ways to destroy Eberron, just floating floating around. It is. It is absolutely true. It's it's something where it's very much. Uh, and this is one of the things I tell game masters is it's. You know, Eberron is a toolbox, essentially, and don't try and use all the tools. You know, pick one or two that uh, that you like and make that, you know, make that the focus. Because if you use all of them at once, uh, then everything gets really crazy. All right, so my guru is familiar with it. So so I'm not sure exactly what he means, but um, he's familiar with it. The, the, the death mechanic is a blocker for him, but the, the <laughs> art he found to be amazing. No, oh, fair enough. See, to me, the thing about the death mechanic is it's something that is just very different 
uh, from you know any other system out there because the point is normally in a typical role-playing game death is the thing to be avoided at all costs you know if you die you have failed uh, in Phoenix because of the combination of it's how your character gets stronger and because of the the card driven uh, spark based system what it means is the player is again much more in control of their character and nine times out of ten when you die in Phoenix it's because you're making a choice it's because you're holding the bridge you're throwing yourself on the bomb you're giving all your energy so you can just take that dragon down and so the point is normally if I die because the orc rolled a critical hit that just feels frustrating and it feels like I lost Whereas most of the time in Phoenix, if you die, it's because you were doing something amazing. And it actually feels like this is an awesome, you know, like I said, it's the moment where Gandalf smashes the bridge and takes the ball rod down with him. And so, like I said, from the outside, it sounds like, oh, my character dies all the time. But in practice, those are usually amazing moments that the players usually are like high-fiving each other because you've done something uh, sort of incredibly heroic. Um, and if, you, if you haven't, mm -hmm. you're, you're doing it wrong. Exactly. And and yeah. like I said, uh, it is occasionally possible that just, oh, you know, rocks fall and everybody dies. But the actual way the mechanic works is you have your physical health and you have your sparks, your, your magical energy. If you die because of physical damage, but you still have sparks, you actually basically possess, you know, haunt one of the other players, and you can still use your sparks to, uh, to boost them, to accomplish things. Your character is still essentially present, even if you've lost your body. Uh, and if you die because you've burnt through your sparks, it means you have done something amazing. Again, you know, uh, that's, that's what sparks are for. And so, like I said, I'd, I'd say again, it's nine times out of ten, but uh, it usually is just people do things you'd never think of doing in other games because, you know, throwing yourself down the mouth of the giant so you can cut him apart from the inside. That's just not a thing you normally do because it's suicide. But in Phoenix, not only is it this amazing moment, you kill the giant, you know, but it is also then your character is going to come back and you're even stronger. So we've sort of taken what is traditionally the worst thing in a role playing game and married it with the best thing, which is your character getting stronger. Uh, the catch to it is that you do only come back seven times. So, you know, this isn't an, a, a total free ride. And so it is also this interesting balance of the stronger you get, the more sort of cautious you have to be with your resources. Whereas at low levels, you can just go crazy and just do all these incredibly reckless things because what's the worst thing that can happen? So, uh, the immortality you of youth, right? Yeah. Well, exactly, and uh, and and it is an interesting balance between, again, the dramatically increased power of a higher level character, uh, but then compared to the the lower level character who has this sense of freedom of again, really, what's the worst that can happen, if that makes any sense. But after seven, you're done, right? After seven, you're done, and then you basically come back as a new first rank character. Uh, who could either be the successor of your previous character or one of the schools that hasn't been part of your wing up till this point. But again, it's this interesting thing of usually you would say, again, taking D&D, we're not going to have a 20th level party and then someone dies and we say we're going to come back as a first level character because what would be the point? You'd be completely useless. Whereas in Phoenix, suddenly saying, okay, I'm weaker, but first off, because of the spark mechanic, I can still hit high numbers. I just have to really pay a lot to do it. Uh, and also, again, I suddenly have nothing to lose. You know, I can, again, I can throw myself on the bomb, uh, whereas you can't. You know, you'd have to disarm that bomb because you can't afford to lose another life, whereas I can just say, don't worry about it, I got this, you know. And so, as I said, it is just a very different sort of experience. Um, from the typical role-playing game, which was why I was so interested to make it, is just because, you know, I before Phoenix, I'd been working on just another setting. Since I can't do anything with Eberron until Wizards unlocks it, um, 
I've been working on another setting that was a fantasy setting, but it was totally system neutral. Uh, everything okay? Yeah, no, I'm just looking at uh, oh, okay. the chat. Sorry. Oh, no worries. Uh, so anyhow, it was totally system neutral because basically there's a lot of good systems out there. I didn't really feel like, oh, the world needs another role-playing system. Uh, with Phoenix, once we had this idea, me and my co-designer, of death is how your character improves, we're like, okay, but that does need a different system because, again, it really is about the player needs to have that narrative control. It needs to be a choice, not just you died because you rolled a one. And and so again, that's why we ended up making a new system was because it really is entirely tied around how this type of story works. So, but you said also fantasy genre, right? It's totally fantasy genre. It's a lower magic setting by default than uh, than Eberron, because you know Eberron, of course, magic integrated society is is really the foundation of the setting. Uh, in Phoenix. It is basically a world in which powerful magic exists, but it is dangerous and, you know, essentially, as it were, you could say it's not something that is reliable in a scientific manner uh, and that as a result has largely been suppressed by the dominant civilization. Uh, and so as phoenixes, you are people who have powerful magical abilities, but, you know, that stands out in the world. This is why you're capable of doing this sort of thing, because we don't just have half a dozen wizards, you know, parked in Arcanics waiting to, to do things. Uh, go on. So if you're a player character, essentially you, you're a player character because you have a higher calling, and that is you're a phoenix. So, like, yeah. I, I had seen, I had, uh, I was checking out um, the Kickstarter, and, mm -hmm. um, you know, it said, you know, you the the players all have a reason to be together. There's no, there's no coming up with it. They're phoenixes. This is what kind of what they do. That that is definitely the case. It's one of the things I like about Phoenix, but it is very different. Eberron is intentionally designed so you can tell any kind of story with it. You can tell a gritty crime story. You can tell Raiders of the Lost Ark. You can tell a spy story. Phoenix is essentially a supernatural, you know, survival horror war story. You know, it is like this is our story. Uh, the players, as a player, you aren't born a phoenix. You become a phoenix by dying, going through spiritual trials, and basically fighting your way back. Uh, and so one of the parts of character creation is who were you, how did you die, why are you back? You know, what gave you the strength to make it through? But it is essentially saying, you know, think of this as Saving Private Ryan. This is a war movie. Uh, your character is part of a squad. You can come up with your own motivation and history, but if you wouldn't have joined the army, you wouldn't be in this movie. So, um, so there's some room there. Uh, if makes that makes sense. any sense. It makes a lot of sense. It actually kind of makes me think of a, ga a game I want to run. We run like one shot games for the fans all the time. And, you know, I just have the yep. name of the the game Valhalla awaits and the premise is you start after mm -hmm. everyone dies and you know their, yep, yep. their life was questionable so if they prove if they prove whether or not they can go to Valhalla or not but yeah the, mm -hmm. like so that's cool so the characters all have you know a lot essentially for the player that wants an elaborate backstory everything mm -hmm. is there for that to happen and but this is now their story going forward Right, and, and that's the point is we actually, you know, the backstory, of course, obviously, if you're just like, I just want something simple, I done came back, you know, that's fine. But we really encourage people to, again, say, to get back, it's essentially you went to Valhalla and you had to go through shit uh, to, to earn the right to come back. Why'd you do it? What are you fighting for? You know, what is it that still matters to you? Uh, and so, again, while everybody shares a common goal, it really is about saying, but tell me your story. You know, what is it that, that is meaning to your character? And then that gives the game master a lot of hooks for what do I work in the adventures? You know, how do I make this particularly compelling to you? So are the standard tropes in there? Like, you know, like I, I guess in D&D &D terms, like your, your rogue, your warriors, your, your spellcasters. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting uh, sort of thing. Of course, yes, there are. There are basically six primary what we call schools that fall into those sort of things. But what actually defines your class, if you will, in Phoenix is how you died and essentially what are the lessons you learned. 
So for example, the Durant Phoenix died because they weren't tough enough or strong enough. And so they come back tougher and they are the hardest phoenixes to kill. And so they are sort of equal parts fighter and warlord. You know, they are the tank, but they also have some combat leadership abilities they can use. But the whole point is it's because your your thing was I need to be tougher. The shrouded phoenix died because of secrets. And so they are essentially the rogue and they can either focus on being hidden uh, or they can focus on uncovering uh, secret things and, you know, sort of equal parts, sort of assassin and detective. Uh, the elemental phoenix is your sorcerer wizard, blow the crap out of everything with fire and lightning. Uh, the devoted is the, the support healer. But the devoted, basically, the only way you heal in Phoenix is, you know, there's no cure light wounds where you just snap and the damage is gone. The devoted can take wounds from another player but then they have them. And if you can find something you don't like, it's essentially you can cure light wounds, but you take that much damage yourself, and then you got to find someone you can inflict it on uh, to get rid of it. And so... Um, That's a really so like, dark turn on the, on the cleric. <laughs> it, it basically, it's a really interesting type of character to play. Uh, and the, the devoted both has the whole, I can take other people's wounds, uh, but the other thing the Devoted can do is, as I say, you're using cards instead of dice. The Devoted can use their own cards, adding them to other people's actions. And so you can be this sort of kingmaker character where, you know, the primary way I fight isn't even by making attacks myself. It's by pushing all of you guys over the edge. Uh, and, you know, you are my weapons, if you will. Uh, and for a character who likes a sort of more you know, tactical, I'm the Hannibal of the A-team, you know, type of character. It's a very interesting style to pursue. Um, but it is also the case that anytime you die, we're going to say, well, what kind of death was that? What are you taking away from it? And that will determine which school you get your new lessons from. Uh, there's a very big difference based on your first death. So essentially there's a huge difference between someone who takes a level of fine, who starts as a fighter and then takes a level of wizard and someone who starts as a wizard, but then takes a level of fighter. Nonetheless, you know, if my first death was Durant, I'll always be a Durant Phoenix, but I could then die for devoted deaths because my character is just all about sacrificing himself for others. And that will make me a very different character. You know, essentially it's multi-classing based on the story of what actually happened. So it's, it's very, you know, as I said, I, I don't mean to monopolize all our time here talking about Phoenix, but it is something that uh, I'm very happy with. Well, I would so. imagine, you know, you're going to be passionate about it. You made the game after all. <laughs> so, Absolutely. You know, it, took, it makes sense. Three years. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I mean, again, uh, you know, flipping things back, I'm also still very passionate about Eberron. Uh, I do uh, Q&As on my website every couple of uh, weeks. I'm going to start posting setting material for Phoenix, but I want to try and make it on my website things that you could incorporate. You know, I'll basically include Eberron conversion notes, as it were. Um, because, like I said, I wish I could do more direct ever on material but i can't until it's it's unlocked <laughs> yes i totally understand so, hey, so are, are there any rumblings or, or rumors like i've i've heard them talk about stuff but i don't know if they're talking with you about stuff it's, you you, you know it's, stage it's advice yeah it, it's definitely uh, to me it's a matter of it will happen it's just a question of when uh, I had hoped it would happen this year. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, but, I mean, it's very much the model of Ravenloft. Uh, you know, it's the sooner or later, I think they will open it up. For, you know, they'll do a thing and they'll open it up for the DMs Guild. But like I said, I don't think it's going to be this year. So it right. could be next year, could be two years, who knows. But, uh but it's the only setting I'm really waiting for. Like the other ones are nice and I like, but like Eberron is the only setting I, I ever played in that wasn't a homebrew. Mm -hmm. uh, that might be true for me too. Just saying. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, although I, I do like Planescape, uh, I've never actually played in it other than Planescape Torment, but I like the principle of it. 
So uh, right. there's there's things like that that easily fit into other things though, like like Spelljammer and Planescape are like that too, where they're connectors. Yeah, and frankly, you know, I've never done it, but I could totally see taking the principle of Spelljammer and working it into Eberron. People have talked about like a space race, you know, trying to get to the moons uh, using sort of Spelljammery uh, rules, and I'm like, sure, that would be interesting. So, and I feel like a lot of people are really passionate about Eberron, and mm -hmm. and like even in the chat is kind of going crazy with. You know, Ebron is the first, you know, their first exposure to D&D. &D. It was their first campaign setting they used. And, guys, mm -hmm. Keith has a website where he's putting stuff up on all the time. If you yeah. want, you know, if you want to find more stuff, like his last art, one of his last articles is LD Reaches. So, yeah, and I'd like to do more about that. Uh, you know, it's basically for me, it's all a matter of since I'm just doing it for for yucks, as it were. Um, and I can't do anything too concrete. Uh, you know, I only get to, to put something up every couple of weeks, but taking the Eldine Reaches, we just wrote a bunch about sort of the conflict, uh, and you know, why it exists. Uh, people have asked, well, can you tell us more about the customs and how exactly it works? And yeah, I'd love to. You know, I it may be a week before I get a chance to write anything about that. But yeah, there's so much about Eberron that I would just love to delve more deeply in. And it's just a matter of having the time, uh, given the restrictions that that I'm working under. Yeah, yeah, so. totally. Keith needs to start a Patreon account and for you know for every donation of a reveal he'll reveal one nuance of detail. <laughs> yeah, uh, I've I've thought about it. Uh, it's basically I don't want to do a Patreon until I have uh, I feel I have the time to be doing enough to justify it. Uh, so if I can get into a a sort of steady rhythm of putting out, as I said, probably some Phoenix material, but aimed at being something you know it's trying to do that sort of backdoor eberron if i can't make official eberron material but if i do a phoenix thing with some eberron conversion notes you know stuff like that uh and then the q and a's that i do again so far wizards hasn't given me any trouble about that but again it's different about doing a q and a about the Eldine reaches and doing so to speak a source book about the Eldine reaches right and uh but obviously if i do something like a patreon uh, it becomes easier for me to justify both to myself and to my wife uh, spending more time, you know, into a, a Q and A's and things like that. Uh, so my ideal thing would be doing a Patreon and having sort of tiers of, uh, you know, if I reach, you know, basically how many articles would I write a month sort of thing. Um, so yeah, that'll happen sometime. So, Derek Moore, do you have a version of Warforged for 5e? I think you do. Yes and no. <laughs> uh, so, I was in, you know, again, we've been poking at this for a long time. And I was in a uh, Extra Life game at Wizards uh, where I played a Warforged. And so, I worked with a bunch of the designers and... Uh, at Wizards to to come up with a Warforged. You know, basically, they came up with one for Unearthed Arcana, and it was frankly terrible. Uh, it missed a whole bunch of the basic concepts of what makes Warforged interesting. It was balanced for the alpha version of 5e instead of the final version. Uh, and so it just was full of problems. Uh, we made a version that's up on my website. If you check out, uh, I think if you just Google hacking the Warforged, you'll find it. Um, and that's better. I still would like to come up with an even more, really look at why people like Warforged and how to best reflect that in 5e, and I think it could be better. Um, again, I haven't, and I even poked Wizards the uh, uh, a couple days ago, and I'm like, uh, not a couple days ago, a couple months ago, you know, basically like, come on, can I can I stick some Warforged up on the, uh, the DMs Guild? And they were basically like, nope. Yeah. Uh, so again, hacking the Warforged is my sort of unofficial pass at it. But again, it's, it's, I haven't done full conversions cause technically I can't, 
And, you know, I'm sort of under slightly more scrutiny on that than if you came up with your own version of the Warforge, Wizards probably wouldn't care, uh, you know, but because I'm me, it's a little, it's a little <laughs> trickier, exactly. Um, but it is still stuff I tinker with, and, and uh, there's a live cast uh, called Maze Arcana, uh, that they're doing a uh, live play of Eberron. They are working with wizards, and I think the Game Master Rudy has done, you know, a passive Warforge that he's using there. I don't know if it's the same one I did or if they tweaked it a bit, uh, but, you know, that's a thing to check out because, frankly, as I said, they are approved by wizards, and I'm consulting with them on story and such. Uh, so that is a thing where if that gets more attention, if that becomes more positive, wizards will take notice. So, so I'm going to say right here, guys, go bug Wizards of the Coast. Tell them you want Keith Baker writing Eberron. Cle clearly, I can see you're passionate about it. You want to, you're just like, I can't oh, yeah. really say anything or do anything. What do you want from me? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I really would. And, and it is basically the case that the point is, it is certainly on their pile of choices. And if you want them to, to take it off the pile, what they need is to know there's people out there who, who want it. And again, there are so many things I would love to write uh, that, that it would be fantastic. But it's been three or four years twiddling my thumbs waiting for it to happen. So. Destroy their Twitter, blow up their email, do whatever you guys got to do. If you, you know, get your friends to do it with you. If, if, if you want to see Keith doing it, make it happen. Well, thank you for the uh, for for the support, and yes, please is all I'm saying. And again, please do check out my website is keith-baker.com. Uh, I do answer questions. I do try and do Q A's Q and A's every couple of weeks, uh, and uh, there's a lot of backlog of stuff I've written over the last year or two. Uh, so lots of things to check out. You've also written some novels too, correct? Uh, I have written novels. I've written six novels in Eberron, uh, the Dreaming Dark trilogy and the Thorn of Brayland uh, books, which are less of a trilogy, even though there are three of them. Uh, but really, each one, you could totally just pick up the middle one and read it without uh, the others. I personally, uh, the Thorn books are my favorite. Uh, the Dreaming Dark is, is fine, but the Dreaming Dark is a more generic sort of fantasy plot. You know, it is a group of adventurers travel across the world uh, to deal with a great evil, as it were. And all the places they go, the things they deal with are Eberron things, but it is a story that you could easily transpose to other settings. Whereas the Thorn books, it is, uh, the main character is a King's Dark Lantern uh, from Brayland, and it is basically Cold War espionage in Eberron. So, so it's just a much more unique to the setting sort of story. We're going back a little ways here, but the fight scene in the Thorn series uses an immovable, yes. an immovable rod very interestingly. Oh, uh, there is there is an immovable rod. I think that's in the second one. Okay, uh, I'm trying to figure out if I read them all or not. No, I think I think that's the second one, and that's sort of the point to me of what I like to do. I'm I'm stubborn about the fact that anything a character does in one of my novels, I can't explain how that is possible. Like I will say, uh, Thorn in particular is a third in in three point five terms. She's an assassin. She's like assassin with uh, some rogue and monk. And none of this is based on actual adventures I've run, but I still look at it and say, how would this work in the world? So she does a lot of death attacks. And so it's like, basically, there's a number of scenes where it's, she sort of draws things out and then suddenly stabs the guy. And I'm like, yes, because an assassin needs three rounds to study a person and then they can make a death attack. Uh, in the Dreamy Dark books, there's an artificer, and I will say everything she does, it is, I could tell you that's this infusion, this, that, you know. Um, but yeah, it is exactly that sort of thing of like what I love in Thorn is she has a dagger uh, called Steel, 
And while there's some hints that he might have some like legacy type powers going on that she doesn't know about, fundamentally, he is essentially a plus one dagger that returns when thrown and is a sentient object that can scry and de I mean, detect scrying, detect magic. And the whole thing is, from a standpoint of an adventurer, this is really not a super exciting object. From the standpoint of a spy, it is incredibly handy. And it's like, basically, she's carrying around a tricorder. Uh, you know, he sort of acts as the voice in her ear uh, that, you know, is a common trope in in uh, spy stuff, you know, where you got the, the person providing information. Um, and again, just all the things you can do with a sentient object, you know, hey, all I need to do is stick this under the sofa and I can come back and, you know, find out what did you hear? Um, and so it's very interesting going back to the immovable rod, you know, just that sort of point of there's a bunch of things where I'm just like, if you look at these things that are generally speaking, not that exciting, um, and then think about, but all the things you could actually do with it. Just sort of like, you know, if you actually had this stuff around, what could you do with it? They're cl they're clamoring for the Nareeb setting. Nareeb. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I understand. Can you can you spell the word? Oh sure. Uh, e uh, N O R R E B E. N O R R E B E. Oh, I get it. <laughs> all right, all right, I got gotcha. you. Well, and that's and that's sort of where I was going with a with um. Uh, with Codex, the previous setting I was doing was like, well, I'll come up with a different setting that is more sort of generically magical. Uh, Phoenix, when we ended up doing it, is very different from Eberron just because it is a setting very much about a particular story. But even there, like I said, that's sort of my plan with some of the things, the articles I want to write over the next couple months is, okay, I can't make it Eberron, but you know, if you drop this location right into the, the Eldine Reaches, shucks, it would perfectly fit. Oh, how about that? You know, so uh, so I will be trying to do at least a little of that. But yeah, it is the sort of, it's true, I could sneakily put up, uh, you know, and, and I might even do this, you know, it's, it's something to think about is there's nothing stopping me from putting something up on the DMs Guild that's like spell forged, you know, <laughs> or something like that. And what do you know, it's a construct race that has nothing to do with, you know, so that, that's not a bad idea, honestly, uh, to, to do some generic -y, hey, what do you know, this is a race of shape changing folks who we won't call changelings, but that's so true, I don't think... I think I could do that potentially. So we do we do know that Watts is going to be mining from there, mm -hmm. from the guild. I mean, maybe I mean maybe if you were to put stuff up there and there was that much demand for it, maybe it would help get things flowing a little bit. It's it's not a bad idea. Uh, as I say, at the moment, I've been I've been focused on Phoenix and uh, and Illumat, but I may I hadn't really thought honestly about that. Hey, let's just make generic versions of the the Eberron races or something, just because I want to do it legitimately. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's true. I mean, I really don't think there's anything. You know, again, I think if I make a, so to speak, a sentient golem race, even if I don't have the backstory in there, I don't think there's anything really that is illegal about that. So yeah. might just do that. Hmm. Hmm, Interesting. There we go. You got. You guys heard it here first on Nerdarchy. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's true. And that would give you a good lead into like when a whole bunch of people are downloading or purchasing it from the DMs Guild. That, right. Exactly. That no, I mean, show, that's that was exactly the desire. That's exactly the point. Is is having something up and being able to say, well, look, X number of people, you know, did take this Warforge like thing. Why are we not doing it officially? So yeah, good idea. I'm not sure. I don't think you'd even have to say anything. I'm sure they're monitoring monitoring those numbers closely. I'm, I'm actually yeah, fasc no, I kind of true. fascinated by this, you know, this version of Wizards of the Coast and how they're doing the D and D and how they've updated and kind of gotten modern with everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. They've definitely done things I've never anticipated. I never thought I'd never I'd see an OGL again. Mm -hmm. Well, it, I think I think the DMs Guild is a great idea. 
Because the point to me is it is very much a lot of the things I would like to write for Eberron uh, make no sense for them as full-on printed source books. Is when they're doing a full-on printed source book, it is in their interest to make it a thing that the maximum number of people would buy. And so they're not going to delve into sort of niche elements of a setting or something like that. Whereas, for example, I would love to write a source book on the goblins in Eberron, you know, that is about the Dakani, that is about playing goblin races, that is about, you know, things like that. And that's not even something every Eberron fan would like. But there is a certain segment of people who would love to see that. If I got together with Donald Barthelme and put together a sort of definitive goblin handbook, he he wrote the Geth series, right? Yes. Yeah, good. Uh, it's definitely good stuff. Oh yeah, absolutely. And and like I said, that's sort of on my list of if they do it to DM's Guild to team up with him and and do a thing. But similarly, there's any number of just specific pieces of Eberron I've been wanting to do more about the planes forever. You know, because they're one of the least developed parts of Eberron. Uh, and I know if I did a Plains of Eberron, you know, source book, that, again, not everyone would buy it, but enough people would buy it to make it worth it for me to do it, mm -hmm. whereas not enough people would buy it to make it worth it for uh, Wizards to do it. And so that's, again, to me, what makes the DMs Guild a great thing, is, is if they put it out, there's all sorts of just little subjects I would love to delve deeper into uh, that I know they would never actually do on their own so fingers crossed so on the plus side i'm thinking you probably did but hopefully you got a better deal with Evron than ed green would have got with forgotten realms at least <laughs> i'm not sure uh what is edward greenwood's uh deal with forgotten realms well it, it doesn't really get talked about but my impression is like 500 bucks or something and and forgotten realms. so no, no, no. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's worth talking about. I mean, uh, the, the simple thing I can talk about because it's public, you know, yeah. is just the deal with the fantasy setting search was uh, you, you got basically when they got down to the three finalists, they paid everybody $20,000 for their the rights to their setting. And then they had said straight up and they did that the one they picked, which was Eberron, you got $100,000. So I got $120,000 for oh, yeah. the rights to Eberron. I don't know what Ed Greenwood got, but I can guarantee that oh, yeah, yeah, throws yeah. it out of the water. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's what I'm saying is a lot of people are like, well, how could you, you know, sell the whole world? And I'm like, because $120,000 is a lot of money for a freelance uh, game designer, you know? Um, and so I don't get like royalties on just random Eberron books. Everything else I do is, is uh, work for hire, just like any other freelancer. But you know, in spite of the fact that it's still very frustrating for me that I can't do stuff with the setting now, it was definitely worth it to me to do it, you know, and so uh, just getting it out the world, you know, it's definitely that it's out there. There's 36 novels set in Eberron. I have a little shelf full of Eberron minis that it's cool to just be like, this is, you know, I've got my Warforged Titan mini and just having things like that where it's like, that was in my brain and now it's a mini. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, so so it's it's definitely as frustrating as it is to not be able to do more with it. Uh, it's still a great experience to, you know, I still consider myself the luckiest nerd alive. Let's see. M MP Productions, Germany. I probably would even buy a source book about the toilets of Eberron. <laughs> and that's what I'm saying is I have long, uh, for a long time, really been wanting to write about plumbing in Eberron. I think it's a fascinating, t okay, well, maybe not, but I'm just saying. I, um, but I mean, there's a lot of things to me, like one of the things, the, the source book that probably I was most disappointed with was The Forge of War, uh, simply because to me, the whole underlying principle of Eberron is using magic as it exists in D&D uh, to solve the problems that we've solved with science and technology. Mm -hmm. And sort of, if this was the tool you had, how would you address these problems? And to me, uh, The Last War is a fascinating uh, situation of, well, what kind of, um, what kind of weapons of war 
and you know what innovations came up during the war like what did you know what are their answers to tanks to mines to you know sort of all the different combat you know battlefield roles that we solve in certain ways how would you solve them uh using the tools we have um and i just think that's a fascinating sort of thing to explore and forge war really doesn't do it very much um so that's the kind of thing i'd love to write more about sort of if you will battlefield magic uh and and what uh what that looks like you know so anyhow so how much of the core like Eberron is you because there, there's so many great things that came out of that setting mm -hmm. that D, D has not seen mm -hmm. uh you'd have to to bring up specifics me today for certain so basically i wrote the 100 page uh core of the setting then I went up to Wizards and sat in a room for a week with James Wyatt, Chris Perkins, and Bill Slavisek, and we just brainstormed stuff. Because of course, you know, when I was writing it, I was all on my own. I didn't even know what they liked. Uh, and there was a lot of just fantastic things that evolved in that week that are now concrete parts of the setting. So, you know, again, that I was certainly part of, but that I'd say, you know, one of the big examples that comes to me is uh, the Talenta Halflings riding around on dinosaurs. That totally, you know, I had them as a nomadic culture, but we were basically sitting in that room saying, okay, but what's something really more interesting for them to be nomads, you know, to, to nomads with a twist? And we're like, okay, dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are part of D&D since the first monster manual, but nobody's ever really done anything with them. And they're very pulpy and hey, a halfling riding around on a raptor. What's not cool about that? And uh, to this day, we still, I think, don't agree on, on who came up with it. Uh, in <laughs> my opinion, I think it was James Wyatt. I think that James Wyatt, uh, his son, his like five-year-old son was in a dinosaur phase. And I believe he said, what about dinosaurs? And everyone's like, dinosaurs? Uh, so that, that's my memory. But again, that's the thing is, is a lot of it, you know, the core of it is straight from my brain, but a lot of the interesting little details came out of that brainstorming collaboration, which is really one of the greatest experiences of my design career. Uh, but if there's a specific detail you can ask and I can tell you. Cause, cause there's Drome, which is, which is a, a yeah. fun place. There's the, the Connie, which is awesome. You know how at the end of the war, they're like, ah, we're just going to keep this part for ourselves. Screw you guys. Well, well that definitely, and Drum had a different name, but the, the kingdom of monsters as a thing that was always there for me, because for me, it was always, I have always been interested in saying D and D is full of these sort of intelligent races. And yet so often we don't really think about them other than when we have to kill them and stopping and thinking about that. But, you know, just as, uh, five nations, uh, it is all about what society looked like if magic is your tool. To me, it is interesting to say what society look like if your tools are harpies and medusas and ogres and trolls. You know, what, what can you build with that? And so Droam is one of my favorite locations just because it's so different. And, you know, that this is a place where this is the home of the monsters and you're the outsider. You know, and what does that look like and what kind of culture do you build? Uh, so I love that. Yeah, if I start listing the things, you'll never get the leave. <laughs> well, well <laughs> there's, the, there's the Moorlands, there's living spells, Sharn, the fact that Sharn basically has a monster ghetto. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and that comes back to, again, uh, from the start. One of the things I can tell you right from the start is that um, in my, my initial, when we got to the 10-page pass, uh, so the intermediary stage of Eberron, I hadn't added many races because I didn't think they'd want to have new races. So I had focused more on do more with the goblins, do more with doppelgangers. So changelings were originally just doppelgangers with the idea that you'd have a monster class like you do in Savage Species. And they decided it would be easier to make a, an EL, you know, a CR plus zero sort of half change, you know, half doppelganger, which is what changelings are. But part of it was, I was just trying to say, these monsters are in the setting, 
let's look at them more deeply. Um, and then it was in the third stage where basically one of the things they said is we'd like to see more new races. And so that was when I'm like, well, what are races that reflect the high magic, you know, sort of aspect or wide magic as we prefer of Eberron. So like the Warforge in particular evolved in that final stage where it was like, okay, a race that was created for the war and that speaks to the way in which magic is incorporated. You know, these were created as a weapon. Uh, and now what's their role? But the Mornland, I have to quickly jump on and just say, and that was a big thing to me is again, part of the point to me is if you have a civilization that's been around for a long time that is successful, why do you have dungeons? Why have these not been cleaned out, you know, resolved? You know, we don't have just random ruins filled with treasure just hanging around just outside the outskirts of town. And part of the point of the Mornland is it's the world's biggest dungeon. Is It's basically saying, and all this just happened a couple of years ago. So it's now we do have lots of ruins <laughs> filled with strange, unknown monsters, you know, filled with whatever, you know, the treasures of an entire country. And so as a way to say, let's take what was both the Mornland and the last way to take let's take what has been a successful uh civilized nation and let's just throw it into chaos and drop a gigantic dungeon right in the middle of it and so that creates a whole lot of opportunity for adventure and such that like i said you wouldn't necessarily find just walking around the u.s today you know but if you suddenly say hey we just turned the midwest into a dungeon well now things got interesting nice now you're giving me ideas. Um, no. So as far as I know, what happened to Seer has never been revealed, right? That's correct. It never will be. Uh, you know, that was one of the principles of the design is saying we wanted places where it's up to you, where even though this is a setting, we're going to leave every game master the opportunity to answer a couple critical questions so that there's the piece of the story that is entirely theirs. And what I've said is I can easily give you six plausible explanations for the morning, any of which could spin off a particular campaign. But the fact of the matter going on the record is I don't have an answer because I don't need an answer that what's important about the morning is what it does to the setting is the, the what it sets up and again if i ever did need an answer if i decide i'm running the campaign where you solve the morning like i said i got a dozen of them to choose from there's lots of cool answers uh it's just that there doesn't need to be one canon absolute answer because what's cool is saying well what is it you know in your game it's one of the overlords of the first age, you know, it was a demon rising and he's gaining his power and is suddenly going to burst out over the world. In my game, it's, it was House Kenneth uh, created the equivalent of an atomic bomb and they're working on a second one and who's going to get it. And I mean, you know, I mean, there's any number of things. So people have said, but in your dreamy dark, dream dream dark series, there's a couple characters, a couple characters who know, they know the answer. So, so aren't you lying? Aren't you lying? And, I'm like, and I'm no, like, actually, no, actually, if you if you read all the things, what they're actually talking about is they're saying the Traveler did it. And the Traveler is the god of sort of chaos and change. And their sort of point is essentially it doesn't matter what it actually was. The point is, it is something that is going to dramatically change everything. They're saying whoever actually the Traveler inspired and, you know, gave the idea to make the weapon or do the whatever, it is clearly the Traveler's hand that made this happen. Now, meanwhile, in the Thorn books, in the third Thorn book, the Eladrin essentially come up with a whole elaborate this happened because this prince got stabbed in the heart and he represented siri and it was a huge act of sympathetic magic and the point is that's what they believe <laughs> you know i'm not saying that is actually the truth but it is a plausible explanation to them um so yeah no, it's perfect because it's the perfect open loop for for each gaming table to explore on their own, and you know it is the it's the catalyst that makes the setting worked uh, work. Well, and and the point to me is what I love is I could come play in your campaign and I don't know the answer even though I made the setting, 
And that's what I, you know, to me, what I want most with a campaign setting is I want it to inspire your stories. I want it to give you stuff to work with. I don't want it to actually just tell you this is exactly what your story has to be. And so that's where with Eberron, we've got a bunch of stuff. You know, frankly, again, a big thing in Eberron, we don't say with absolute certainty, do the gods exist? That's up to you. You could decide the sovereigns totally exist. They're just like gods in other settings and they are going to personally meddle with stuff. Or you could decide, no, they really don't at all. They're just sort of these psychic concepts that give power to clerics, but, you know, they don't take a direct hand or anywhere in between. And, you know, again, that's really up to, do you want gods interfering directly in your campaign? Well, you know, even taking it down to a lower level, one of the decisions you guys had made and did was like your Uber characters are like 12th level. Like, it, yeah. you know, there's no Elminsters in Eberron and it, yeah. it's perfect. Like the heroes get to be heroes. I've run yeah. four or five fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons one shot Eberron campaigns. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't rem I, I think it was five, but like I love the feel of Eberron and a, at least a couple of them I felt like I hit it where like at the end of the adventure, the the adventurers that did what they set out to do, but they still lost. And that's mm -hmm. what I loved about reading Eberron novels. It, mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. There was always that like bittersweet victory. Absolutely, and and it's it, honestly that's one of the things that led me to games like Phoenix. Is the whole point of Phoenix is there's very rarely a perfect solution, um, and you know Eberron. There's a lot of interesting sort of points touching on what you just said. You know, I mean, the point is uh, in part because Forgotten Realms existed that part of the point was saying, I want to make a setting that tells a different kind of story because if you want the other kind of story, you got it. If you want Elminster, he's there. If you want gods that walk around and do things, they're there. And so in Eberron was saying, even at first level, we want your characters to feel like they stand out, that you know you are a pulp hero, as it were. Uh, and that, you know, again, some of our big villains are relatively low level. You know, the Lord of Blades is listed as being 12th level. Part of the point there is because we want the big villains to grow with you. They aren't just, oh, they're massively over your reach, and then when you hit epic level, they, they're there and you beat them and they're done. We want ideas of characters like the Lord of Blades to be someone who, even as you become tougher, he's becoming tougher too. You know, Dr. Doom, it's not like the Fantastic Force gained a level and suddenly he's pointless. Um, but beyond that, it was also the idea that that goes into the novels, is with Forgotten Realms and Dragonlance, where the novels are canon, the novels define the setting. And what we really wanted with our novels is our novels to be inspiring. These are the sorts of stories that could happen. You could directly use a character from one of our novels if you wanted, but the setting isn't about our characters, it's about your characters. And, and you know, we want it to feel like this is a place where if something bad happens, there is no 20th level wizard who's gonna jump in and solve the problem for everybody. We had, um... So we, we had a campaign going uh, back in third edition uh, in Eberron, and it, it was one of the longer running campaigns I had, and we had one of our players was actually leaving. He was moving away. Mm -hmm. And and I think I, I knew this ahead of time, so I kind of set him up to infiltrate the party to gain information. Mm -hmm. So on the, the, the last his last session, uh, I forget exactly who I had come for him, but um, he, he infiltrated House Thrask, I believe, and I had mm -hmm. a player that was House Thrask mm -hmm. in that game as well. So, he, you know, he, he convinced them that he was from the house. Well, right. at the very end, the watch shows up to cart, cart the player away, and the party is ready to throw down with him. The whole time, he's been, like, you know, sneaking information to crime lords for them uh -huh. and stuff. And like the the one player, he's like, no, he's in my house. We'll fight to uh -huh. the death. And he's finally like, uh, no, guys, actually, they're right. I like you guys. It wasn't personal, but no. And I love that. And and that's the point of of that's 
you know, I mean, it's it's one of the things we say in chapter nine of the the original Eberron setting book is, you know, things don't always end well and having shades of gray. And that's the whole point of that takes a little getting used to. Of uh, you've got to have a group that's that's that loves that. Is that that's the point to me is I love a story that feels, you know, you take a show like Fargo. You know, I mean, I love a show a, a thing where to me it feels more real because everything isn't always perfect. Uh, but you know, you do have some people who, who will just get all bent out of shape about a thing like that. So you got to make sure you know your players. Yeah. Uh, uh, you, you inspired me to use null ninjas. <laughs> well, and, and that definitely is a thing to me that, that I also wanted to do is to look at races and such in different ways and just say again, you know, gnomes, for example, well, tinker gnomes or jolly forest gnomes, those are done. Those are out there. Uh, taking the gnomes in particular, well, they're small, they're sneaky, they're good at illusions, they're good with, frankly, uh, alchemy, which means poisons. Uh, so making Zolargo, you know, again, my, my uh, claim to fame there is we have the scariest gnomes in, <laughs> in D&D. Uh, and who would think that of gnomes? But, although I think you said gnolls, but I'm just saying I love my gnomes. No, no, absolutely. You know, uh, you know, even just talking to you, it kind of refreshes my memory because it's been a while since Everon first came out and, mm -hmm. and we played it heavily. Yep. And the gnomes of Zilargo were terrifying. <laughs> and, and that's the, the point is it's the first setting where I've had a bunch of, I've, or not the first setting, but it is a, a, a thing where I've had a bunch of people saying this is the first time I've ever felt like playing a gnome. <laughs> and there you go. And, uh, you know, even the, um, uh, is it Don Bassenwaith? Is that how you say his name? You say it one more time. I, the, my cutout. Uh, Don Bassenwaith? Bassenwaith? Uh, yeah, Bassingthwaite. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dan Bassingthwaite. So, like, yep. His, Don, his, yeah. inter his interpretation of the goblins and the goblinoids and how mm -hmm. he portrayed each of them was just so amazing. Like goblins are kind of like, and kobolds are kind of like a joke in D and D. Yeah. But you know, the, the goblins that he made, yep. I think the silent wolves, maybe. Um, oh, the, well, there's the, the silent knives and the silent wolves, the, the cash clans, the silent clans. So yeah. Yeah. You know, they were essentially ninjas. Yeah. You know, and yeah. they were, again, another monster was kind of a joke, but he made right. them terrifying. Right, it's the the Shurak Kesh, uh, and and that was actually one of the things because the goblins are one of my favorite parts of the setting, and so it was one of the things when he started doing the trilogy. I'm like, oh, you beat me to it, because again, but he's done a great job with them. Uh, but that was the same point to me of the the Dakani in general, of just saying uh, goblins are essentially no different from humans. You know, there is nothing about you know, and they're supposed to be very martial, you know, at least the hobgoblins. And so it's like, why can't you have a goblin civilization that is as impressive as any human civilization? Uh, you know, why would they, why have they never sort of risen to that sort of level? And so taking the Takani and saying, essentially, our Roman Empire was goblins. Um, and so... Uh, and one of the one-shots I've done at cons is to simply say here you go, you're a unit of Dakani, you know, you're part of the Kesh Valar, uh, you've got your Charak Kesh Goblin Assassin, you've got your, you know, Bugbear uh, Berserker Warrior, you know, and sort of uh, saying you're the Goblin A-Team, you know, and uh, it's a thing I still think, even at Wizards, a lot of people don't really get why this is compelling. You know, and I'm like, but it's interesting, you know, in part, even when you're using them as villains, heroes are measured by villains, and the more badass the villains are, uh, the cooler your world feels, you know. So, uh, so yeah, having the goblin, again, who feels like, oh, nobody takes, you know, goblins aren't dangerous, and then having that goblin be a badass, you're like, oh, holy shit, didn't see that coming. I, I would so. like to say too, Everon kind of put the, the like one of the final nails in the coffin at Wizards of the Coast when it comes to writing uh, for novels. Like mm -hmm. after you know after like that contingent kind of went out, like the stuff they started putting out was just not good. They put mm -hmm. out and 
you know, it's I know it's subjective, and but for the most part, like so, Ra would come in and he'd write some novels, but a lot of the guys that were writing for him before weren't, and you know, I would I want to say after that, like with uh, fourth edition, the writers they brought in, they only they only put out one book that I read and I was fantastic, and you know, it, and of course it was because it was Mel Autumn. And that was sooner dead, and it was Gamma World, and he must have written it just because he wanted to write about Gamma World. I can't, I can't uh, imagine. It's a fun <laughs> setting. <laughs> I can't no. imagine they could afford him, uh, based off of the writing they were bringing in afterwards. Just my um, opinion. So I do have to get back to work soon. Okay, so are there you. any particular? Yeah, are there any particular questions you want to hit or subjects you want to hit before I go? Uh, we covered a pretty wide gambit. Um, you know, mm -hmm. we we finally got back to back to Evron, which I'm fine with Phoenix Command, and I like hearing about oh, yeah. new games. But but we have a uh, we have some pushy fans out there, Artwood. Um, oh no no, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I I, I definitely uh, love talking about Evron. Again, definitely check out my website and send questions to me. You know, there's a contact button there. Uh, but as I said, I could do one or two more questions if you want to want to hit anything before I go. You you got anything, Nate? I've been doing all the talking. If not, we will free you up. No, I've I've uh, enjoyed the conversation. I've just been uh, listening and absorbing it all. Cool. Yeah. Uh, go on. I want to thank you for coming on. We really do appreciate it. I, I I'm a huge fan of Ever. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of your work, and I want to check start checking out you know this other uh, the Phoenix Command as well. Yeah, no, and I'm uh, definitely happy to come back uh, at some point in the future and talk more because I love talking. Just things are a little crazy right now. So, again, sorry I was late. No big deal. And if every, if you do decide to go in the DMs Guild uh, mm -hmm. with uh, Norib, uh, let us know, and we'll definitely <laughs> help get the word out for you. Uh, I definitely will. And, uh, and, yeah, as soon as some time clears up, I think I'll probably do that because why not? So, uh, so okay. All right. Uh, With that, guys, until next time, me. stay nerdy. All right. Take care.